Pikachu roll isn't that insane, right? They're pretty crazy, but they're not that insane. They wouldn't make a terrible anime. And that's why I find it bizarre that anyone funded it, let alone Crunchyroll. Oh no! What is this? Crunchyroll, why? If you're somewhat versed in the modern anime landscape, or are just as terminally online as I am, there's no doubt you've heard of the raging dumpster fire known as XARM. If you've never heard of XARM till now, first off, I'm sorry. But also, you're in for one of the craziest stories of how a disastrous production caused the release of one of the most infamous anime of all time. Taking one quick glance at the trailer, it's more than understandable why the anime has the reputation it does. It's no secret that this adaptation is not good. You'd think X-Arm turned out the way it did due to little to no budget. But no, X-Arm's adaptation was backed, funded, and licensed entirely by anime streaming powerhouse Crunchyroll. You know, the same people that brought you Jibby, yay. Hi, Guardians. Okay, you know what? Maybe Crunchyroll doesn't have the greatest track record. But still, when you look at the visual quality of this anime, you can't help but wonder. How the hell did XARM even release in the state it was in? It takes a hefty amount of audacity to release this trailer and unironically end it with declaring war against all sci-fi series around the world. Is XARM really as bad as the trailer suggests? Does it deserve the status of one of the lowest rated anime of all time? Mm, yes. I think it rightfully deserves every ounce of criticism it gets. But I don't want to just say it's bad and leave it at that. Whether or not you've seen the anime for yourself, you know it's bad. I want to dig deeper. I'm going to dive into XARM with a candid yet critical lens and give the anime a fair chance, whether it deserves it or not. Now, I don't mean to beat a dead horse because I'm definitely not the first to rip into the show. However, I think it's worth taking a look back at XARM a couple years after its airing, because I think this anime is an interesting case study in how despite hefty financial backing, poor management, and an absence of understanding of the animation process can not only lead to an embarrassing and disastrous final product, obviously, but forever tarnish the legacy of a well-respected, if unpopular, original work. Let's dive into what went wrong, what is wrong, and how we got from this to this. What a better place to begin than the wild story behind this anime's production, and how it even released in the condition it was in. Now, the producers behind X-Arms anime knew from the beginning it was going to be a CGI slash 3D anime. And you know what? Fair. I know there's a large stigma against the concept of 3D in the anime community, as there's been countless examples of poorly composited CGI in the past and even today. It doesn't always look good, but usually that's up to personal opinion. Uncanny the sum, as long as a full CGI anime can't look good. And from a production standpoint, considering XRM's high-tech mechanical setting and environment, I understand their reasoning. Of course, though the end result looks less than visually appealing, there was a lot more at play here. One of the main problems was a heavy misjudgment of the type of talent and team to pull off a full 3D anime. Nonetheless, do it well. The producers wanted to hire a live action director under the impression that they may have a stronger understanding of the 3D space, which was their first of many mistakes. While elements of cinematography can be used to enhance an anime's visuals, animation requires a very different set of skills. Skills live action director Yoshikatsu Kimura did not have. Yeah, Crunchyroll hired a director that had almost zero experience working on an anime prior. But giving this anime one quick glance, you didn't need me to tell you that. It's not that Yoshikatsu doesn't have talent, but his skill set was definitely not suited for the task at hand. What didn't help was Yoshikatsu's baffling choice to work with his live action team instead of anime industry professionals. Which may explain why Studio Visual Flight was brought on board to animate. And you may have guessed, Visual Flight also has barely any experience working in the anime industry. They're primarily known for their background in making environmental assets, though they have smaller teams to tackle things like character design and modeling. And believe it or not, these are the same people who are responsible for the environmental assets of FromSoft's Elden Ring and Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Considering the visual state of this anime, I find that wild. While they do have personnel experienced with motion, it's still worth noting that this company is not particularly known for animating. Why they were brought on board instead of a more well-established animating company is beyond me. But to make things even worse, a large sum of the budget was used to hire an experienced martial arts stunt coordinator to assist with the anime's fight choreography. 
which was set to be motion captured. Throw on well-known industry voice talent, and you're left with very little budget for anything else. Now, I have no doubt the base choreography was well put together, and it probably looked really cool in the studio. But the problem is that raw motion capture data doesn't look amazing. It requires a heavy level of expertise to make it look professional, which with a now limited budget, alongside a cramped timeline and animation inexperience, was near impossible. The anime was doomed before it even aired. I honestly feel pretty bad for some of the parties dragged into this mess. I especially feel bad for the original mangaka. While I'm not entirely convinced that the manga sequel ended prematurely due to the anime's failure, it really does suck that he'll forever have his original work associated with the disastrous adaptation and anime's reputation. Multiple people carry the blame here, from the director's overconfidence to the executives who gave creative lead to someone not fit for the job. Let this be a lesson that people who make anime should probably have a fundamental understanding of anime, or at least animation. Speaking of, I haven't actually touched on the anime itself, have I? X-Arm is a sci-fi anime, sure, but not a lot of people know what it's about. For the sake of the video structure, I'll cover the story's beginning and synopsis as told in the anime, which is mostly the same as the manga, bar a few minor details and cut material. We open with a vision of the then distant future of 2020, with pockets of what appeared to be black holes consuming and destroying the cityscape and the people who live within. Through this epic filter and series of definitely not stock lightning effects, we get a brief glimpse at some boy with a strange device on his arm, presumably an X arm. We shortly rewind back to good old 2014, you know, when things were normal. Five at We're then introduced to Akira Natsume, a shy high school boy with a strange phobia of technology, and is our central protagonist. Worth noting that Akira looks strangely similar to the guy we saw earlier in the opening. Foreshadowing, perhaps? Akira lives his day-to-day -day life like a normal teenager, wanting to follow in the footsteps of his prestigious and well-accomplished 2D brother, who in contrast is well-versed in the world of technology and android building. After a short conversation between the two about Akira being the best version of himself and overcoming his fear of technology, Akira uses that newfound courage to try and save a nearby girl from a set of goons. However, it wouldn't be an anime if the main protagonist wasn't hit by a giant truck just before or after they accomplished what they set out to do. And thus ends x -Arm. <sighs> If only. Following one of many sick action scenes of police duo Alma the android and Minami the human, Akira awakes from a 16 year long coma with his brain inside a machine. A machine that Minami and Alma were assigned to retrieve from a smuggler's ship. More specifically, this machine is an X-Arm, one of many devices capable of mass destruction, technology far too advanced for the modern age, and are thus contained, collected, or destroyed by the X-Arm Countermeasure Prevention Police Division. The world is very different from how Akira remembers it, from what little he can remember anyways. Irony aside, considering his phobia, Akira unfortunately doesn't have much time to adjust to these unusual circumstances, thrusted in the middle of a heist, with his existence being the prize. Despite his confusion and reluctance to fight, he assists Minami and Alma escape the ship with him in one piece, in whatever way he can. After all, the potential he carries as an X-Arm is near limitless. Apparently. Long story short, he possesses Alma's body to save Minami with these sick moves, then hijacks the vessel upon being plugged into the ship's port. With him, Alma, and Minami safe, the fate of Akira is brought into question. Ultimately, he joins the task force to help them eradicate the heinous crimes caused by these dangerous devices, cooperating with the police to hopefully regain his lost memories, body, and humanity. On paper, the premise doesn't sound terrible, and believe it or not, that holds true for the whole anime. I admittedly really like this idea of a task force assigned to rid the world of technology far too advanced for the modern age, which of course includes the X-Arms themselves, and our protagonist being an X-Arm, forced to work alongside this team, makes for an interesting setup. There's also a decent bit of humor in how they treat Akira like an object, and how that mistreatment plays into the internal conflict he faces throughout the show. However, it's worth mentioning that the original work is doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Because when adapted and put into action, everything starts falling apart. You can thank the tremendous amount of corner cutting for that. Uh, essentially, anything that wasn't a major story beat got cut. Whether it be world building, important character monologues, or minor plot points contributing to the larger narrative. 
And who would have guessed that all that missing context makes for a confusing and nonsensical mess? Now, I promise I'll talk extensively about the production value of this anime later, but can we just take some time to acknowledge the multitude of issues with this anime's narrative? First off, the pacing is a disaster and probably one of the anime's biggest sins next to its visuals. We jump headfirst into nearly every single major conflict with little downtime to get the Nora cast and protagonist. The journey doesn't feel like a journey. It feels like a checklist of loosely correlated events the protagonist has to tackle one at a time. Majority of character action feels hasty or not thoroughly thought out, yet characters are almost always unpunished for this. Let's not forget the multitude of times where life or death combat seemingly freezes in time, just so characters can have some meaningless chit chat with one another, killing the momentum of the fight at hand to simply overcome their adversity by the power of friendship. Or maybe they'll have the villain straight up tell our heroes their time sensitive master plans in excruciating detail, which you may have guessed would be the primary contributor to that villain's demise. Or, or how about the inclusion of cheesy, needlessly repetitive, and redundant dialogue? Sure, why don't we have multiple characters verbally react and detail everything they encounter and witness? Who could forget such lines like, suicide bombings can go to hell, or lines with the energy of, I'm going to kill you now, or I'm blank. You're blank, it's blank. I understand not everything I addressed had to do with pacing, a lot of the issues I mentioned are simply tropes many anime are guilty of. Tropes that I admittedly already don't love. But in X Arm, it's way more headache inducing than it would be otherwise, because it feels like wasted time, which only further contributes to the cramped pacing in each episode. And despite the active quest and stakes clearly established, watching it all play out, I can't help but get lost with how many poorly established plot points are happening at any one time, especially in the latter half. No story beat feels like it's given time to breathe, we're given barely any time to immerse ourselves in the setting, the main action doesn't feel fulfilling or rewarding, I can go on. Altogether, it really does make for a less than enjoyable viewing experience, and as a result, can make theoretically exciting plot points uninteresting or boring. Another issue is the immense absence of context throughout the anime. Things happen in X-Arm, but you never have an idea how or why they do. I understand, especially with the genre of science fiction, there needs to be a certain level of suspension of disbelief, but at the same time, the anime needs to be grounded in some sort of reality and hold some degree of respect for the audience. You may wonder how characters know overly specific situational information, or how exactly they pulled impossible off-screen tasks off, and you may be understandably disappointed that you almost never get an answer as to why, mostly because the anime is structured in a way where it can't give you one. For example, what even is an X-Arm? We know what they're capable of and what they're roughly classified as, but what are they? How did they come to be? How does this technology work? What are their limitations? There's still so many mysteries surrounding the various X-Arms in existence. Considering how integral the X-Arms are to this world's story, it shocks me the anime barely briefs the audience the answer to these world building questions. And don't even get me started on what's possible in cyberspace. That's a whole other can of worms I really don't want to get into. Lore and world building can really make or break a lot of the viewing experience, and I'm upset the anime didn't do a lot of it, let alone do it well the few times they bothered trying. The little we do get are either never mentioned again or explored any further which is frustrating in its own right as it leads to unanswered questions and funnily enough, more confusion. And you could probably only imagine what an absence of context would do for the myriad of plot twists. Oh, the plot twists. Most of them you can see coming from a mile away, but the few near the end are mind boggling to the highest creative degrees and not in a good way. With little setup, reveals don't carry much emotional weight and feel like they come out of nowhere. There's this minor character who wears a skull mask throughout the end half of this anime called Auctioneer, who's kind of this mystery figure who auctions off X-Arms in his possession to infamous criminal gangs around the world. But not really. It's more like he uses his collection as bait to try and get those interested in X-Arms to turn on one another, but even then I'm not completely confident in that description. It's complicated especially considering how little we really know about him. 
But spoiler alert for those who care, the twist is that Auctioneer is actually Akira's brother's clone. Oh my god! That's right, your boy has entered the 3D plane. If you couldn't have predicted it, his brother is responsible for conserving and saving Akira's life after his accident, and is also partially responsible for the creation of Beta, the evil twin slash X-arm counterpart to Akira we see in the opening moments of the anime, and the main villain for the show. Auctioneer aims to pay for his original sins by taking down the destructive and trigger-happy Beta, now let loose into the world. Now if you're lost, don't worry because you're legitimately working off as nearly as much context as they give you in the anime. While I had my suspicions this minor character was somehow related to Akira or his brother, a lack of explanation opens the floodgates to a plethora of questions. Questions that are not clearly answered in the anime. Like, why a mock auctioneering gig as your method to achieve your goal? It's horribly convoluted. Why go the anti-villain route and not just join or help out the police department directly, especially if your goals are nearly identical. Surely there was a better way to take down Beta in the end, right? Maybe there's some distrust or history with the police or Japanese government, which would be fair, but if he has methods of contacting Akira in cyberspace, why was he so adamant about keeping his identity hidden from him? Like, did you really think Acura was going to trust a stranger requesting you to ditch all contact with the police department in exchange for your protection? You really thought he'd trust the dude in the skull mask who auctions X-Arms off as a character gimmick? Does it have to do with him keeping his identity hidden from Beta also? Or am I just missing something? It's not well spelled out in this adaptation. It makes you wonder why he wouldn't reveal his identity as a clone of his brother earlier in the anime, especially if one of his goals is to gain Akira's trust. Also, a clone? Are we really going to gloss over that narrative detail? Uh, uh, oh, uh, okay, I guess we are. Huh. That's just one of many examples where things just don't make as much sense as they should. And that's not even the worst twist. Just as the main journey is wrapped up, we get a major character secret revealed, character death, and world ending conflict all jammed in the final episode. Each of which comes completely out of nowhere and is hardly relevant to the plot up to this point. Before any question gets answered, the protagonist sacrifices himself to save the world, which was primarily shown off screen, mind you, and the anime abruptly ends. No aftermath shown from him saving the world, no explanation for this character's secret being revealed. Nothing. I can get leaving things open-ended or open to interpretation, but not like this. And in my opinion, this is probably the worst episode of the 12. It turns the finale from messy but complete to unsatisfying and unfinished. And it sucks because I actually like some of the elements of this ending, but it should have been given its own arc, not a single episode. Whatever. 12 episodes in, I should have expected this. I have no one to blame for my disappointment other than myself. The characters are another pain point for the anime because there really aren't any. Okay, that's not entirely fair, but at times it really does feel that way. It's hard to build a connection with any one character when we barely know anything about them. Minor characters fare even worse as they're introduced and then promptly forgotten about. Even the few moments we manage to get some backstory, while nice, it doesn't really tell us anything meaningful about the characters themselves, just what they've been through. Typically, you could use this information to draw connections to how a character behaves and learn about them via subtext. However, an X-Arm, that couldn't be further from the case. For example, despite being with the protagonist before and after his accident, the emotional connection we have to him is minimal. Aside from his phobia that's dismissed pretty swiftly, we really don't know much about him or his brother. The anime makes a big point in how big of an influence Akira's brother is to him, but we really just get the same singular flashback over and over again of this one and a half minute scene of them talking in episode one. We barely get any time to explore just how important this family dynamic is to him. Unfortunately, it gets even worse, because once the plot gets going, Akira turns more and more into a plot device than a main lead, only further driving the audience disconnect. You'd think Akira's phobia would play a larger role in the story for them to emphasize it so much in episode 1, but no. He adjusts to this new world like it's nothing, not going through any emotional development throughout, simply just 
being told what to do as he has no other choice. Another example would be Minami's backstory revolving her dead parents. It's a sad story as it's told, sure, but aside from introducing the character of Soma, her sibling, and his quest for revenge, it really doesn't do anything for her already lacking character. It mainly just gives her some relevance in an already disconnected story, and is unfortunately a plot point I feel could be written out, at least in the adaptation. Or how about the existence of Beta as a villain? Like he's kind of a cool character, who single-handedly triggered a rapid change in the world after a series of major attacks he caused, finding entertainment in discord and chaos. However, I really can't say much else about him beyond that. He's apparently the secret weapon brought to life? It's not clear. He obviously carries heavy resemblance to Akira, but we legitimately learn barely anything about his creation, existence, or purpose, aside from the unexplored detail that Akira's brother and some head scientists were responsible. And Akira's memories involving Beta, the one we got a glimpse of in episode 1, Akira eventually regains those memories, but we as the audience are never given any more context or shown what else happened that day. Vague character descriptions are most I can say for the majority of the cast. Now, some characters are worse for this than others, but it's a pretty blanket issue for everyone. There's genuinely some interesting sci-fi ideas in here with tremendous amounts of potential, but that potential is never realized. Now, don't get me wrong, the original work isn't a masterpiece either, but I promise that things are structured and told in a much better way in the manga. And know what's crazy? I've talked this much and I haven't even touched upon the atrocious production value of this adaptation, which is how and why so many people even know about this anime in the first place. When it comes to the anime's visual style, it's hard sometimes to draw the line between incompetence and just pure laziness. More often than not, though, it's a mixture of the two. I'm appalled the anime even aired in the state it was in, that they thought this would be okay. Can someone tell me where the hell was QA? Not sure which one's worse, the thought of them approving this, or the idea that it never got passed by them in the first place. Anyhow, where do I even begin? Almost immediately, one thing you'll notice about this anime is how washed and desaturated the visuals are. It gives this anime a very bleak and dry feeling, which is more than fitting, but that's besides the point. It makes things uninteresting to look at. I think they were trying to go for a specific mood or aesthetic, but it really ends up sucking out a lot of the energy of what's attempting to be a higher energy show. It doesn't help that most environments are drab, empty spaces that don't feel lived in. Textures on models sometimes clip or glitch out uncontrollably. Nearly every surface has this bland gradient texture applied to it in what I assume is an attempt to give the environment more detail. It doesn't look great in my opinion. What I'm calling cyberspace and the visualizations associated with it also look bad, especially the manifestations of viruses and defense systems. The visual effects and transitions are corny and distracting especially considering most effects are overlays on the final edit, often clashing with the environments or models they're affecting. There's this constant white smog effect that fills the bottom half of the screen in most settings, which alone is super distracting, but to make things even worse is that it doesn't shift or change with the camera angle. It's clearly just being played over top of the episode. Or how about this mirror effect in episode 1? Not only does this clearly keyed on reflection not move with the first person camera, but the reflection in the mirror doesn't even change with the position or distance away from the viewer. The reflection remains consistently in place until the very end, when it zooms in on a delay. Or how about the camel in this guy's uniform, which is also obviously keyed on, not even moving with the character. The list goes on. Other times, filters, lighting choices, or framing completely obstructs the action. Which is a problem when one of the main genres of this anime is, well, action. Not that said action is much better to begin with. As already established, all fight choreography is done via motion capture. I'm not quite sure if they expected the audience to be impressed by Alma's sick flips, but in practice the movement doesn't look good. Characters seem to randomly accelerate or decelerate in fight, never moving in a consistent motion that flows well. Other times, characters will just stand there and wait for their turn to get beat up, going in one by one like an old school kung fu movie, or your average bronze League of Legends team fight. Hell, sometimes villains will just straight up watch our main characters get away, making no effort to chase after them. Physics and gravity don't seem to be consistent either, and at times seem completely non-existent. I get it, it's science fiction and it's anime, 
the rules are going to be broken every once in a while. I know something like this helicopter flying upside down, or these weird copy pasted sexy cat girl robot things dropping down to the ground instantaneously is easy to laugh at. I don't know, a line needs to be drawn in the sand at some point. Sometimes it's not even the action itself that makes it unwatchable. The slow motion and random transitions slash zoom ins make most action nauseating. The random camera movement and excessive amounts of motion blur really don't help much with this either. Oh yeah. This fully 3D anime for some reason has this weird clash of 2D and 3D characters existing in the same space. Now it's obviously not impossible to incorporate CGI and 2D animation together and do it well, but whoever composited this anime clearly did not know what they were doing because it looks awful. Well, neither look good, I think it would have been far better to just stick with one or the other. Mixing the two together in this particular way takes me further out of an experience I was struggling to keep myself in. Now, the character designs themselves aren't terrible, but the clunky model they're attached to are. The models have this unnerving thousand yard stare that burns into your soul, which they turn into a plot point, by the way. You may think I'm joking, but I'm not. That's something they explicitly brought up in the end stretch. Anyways. The shadows cast on the model's faces look off and ugly, characters often default to either this creepy grin or just straight up emotionless, which makes me struggle to take serious, depressing, or life-threatening moments with a straight face. At most, their eyebrows will move to express despair or anger, which looks exactly the same in most scenarios. Other times, if characters are not the central focus, they'll rest in these A-like poses with their arms and hands open to their side. Conversation is static and boring because all characters do is just stand there with their jaw moving up and down, with limited visual variation, expressions, or communicative gestures, lip syncing may as well be non-existent, and you see this kissing scene? Don't worry about the context, I promise you'll still have questions even after I explain it. And it's mostly fan service anyways. See that blinding white light blocking the lips of Alma and Minimi? I can almost guarantee you that the flash of white was not to censor the kiss, but was instead added to hide the heads clipping into one another. It really helps you appreciate the tolerable or even great CGI in anime, realizing just how bad things could be. Not sure if that's a bar worth setting, but I digress. If I have to give X-Arm any points, it's that the voice actors really did give it their all and actually managed to breathe some life into these otherwise lifeless characters. The rest of the audio mixing is mixed at best, pun not intended. Most sound effects are overly compressed and cheap. Gunfire will sometimes sound more like balloons being popped than actual gun being fired. <laughs> There's zero vocal effects in Akira, despite his voice coming from a metal machine, and at times, sounds seem to be completely missing from the scenes they're featured in, an example being a lack of ambient fire crackling at a burning location. The soundtrack is generic, not all bad, but does its job, that is, when it is present, because for some reason there are key moments where there probably should be music, but there's not, leaving this unnerving void in the soundscape that makes the constant character grunting all the more awkward. <laughs> And that's not to say the score is always good either, as there's a few really annoying tracks featured throughout the anime. As a whole, the production value is laughably bad. There's so many problems with the visual display of the anime that there's no amount of tweaking that would reasonably improve the viewing experience. I feel if x had received a proper adaptation, it could have legit been a fun, if narratively flawed anime. Well, funny at first, by the midway point a lot of the wacky charm of the animation had started to fade away, which made it hard to push through to the end. And that concludes our journey through x -Arm. A journey with its ups and downs, mostly downs, but just downs if we're being honest. X-Arm's failure can be attributed to a plethora of issues, from its production value, narrative corner cutting, having a team who never made an anime before, misuse of budget, among many, many others. Altogether, the x -Arm may honestly be the worst anime adaptation in existence. However, depressing as it sounds, I feel the bar can still be set even lower. Still, I'm genuinely curious if even one person who worked on this project was proud of the final product. There's no way they didn't know it was bad, right?
Given a proper adaptation, X-Arm could have probably turned from one of the most infamous anime of all time to an easy cult classic. I originally checked out this anime for a good laugh, and I got one, sure, but man did I come out of it somewhat empty inside. If I'm being real with you, I surprisingly didn't hate X-Arm as much as I thought I would. Despite its terrible qualities, it was an experience that I don't regret, and in a lot of ways, I kind of miss it. Though that probably says a lot more about me than it does about the anime. I guess I have some hidden passion in watching terrible media for the sake of tearing it apart. But that definitely won't be the case for everyone. Here's what I'll say to the people even somewhat interested in checking out the anime. If you find enjoyment in consuming terrible media, or are just looking for some good drunk fun with the boys, X-Arm is an easy recommendation, be it specifically under those circumstances. If you're curious, but understandably don't want to sink too much time into something you know will be bad, I promise the first episode will be more than enough to get a feel for just how awful things are. If the premise sounded like something up your alley, unironically the manga may be worth checking out. I personally double dipped and started reading it for the sake of the video, and I have to say, from what I've read so far, it's a much more mature, grounded, and better paced version of the story. There's a lot of nudity, but it's a thorough and enjoyable read. Eons better than the Crunchyroll airing. Again, it's not perfect, but sci-fi fans should definitely get a kick out of this. Worth mentioning that though the manga is finished, I had heavy difficulty finding a full English version available for reading. Frustratingly, most scanlations I found stop around the midway point in the story. And at the time of making this video, it's been almost a year since the last English update. So proceed at your own caution. Maybe there is a fully translated version out there, but I personally could not find one. Maybe that'll change after this video comes out? Maybe it won't. Uh, only time will tell. If you've encountered or watched an anime equally or somehow worse than X-Arm, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll make a video on it if it piques my interest. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me by subscribing, leaving a wholesome and not toxic comment, etc. I truly appreciate it. My name is Charion, and thanks for watching.